Hello, Max Truscott of the Aviation News Talk podcast here to talk about the fatal crash of a Learjet at Gillespie Field near San Diego last night. I'm creating this video to replace one I published last night a few hours after the crash, as I realize now I overlooked one or two factors. I recorded that video from a motel in Southern California where I was giving instruction to a Vision Jet owner. Now, if you would please hit subscribe so you don't miss next week's show. And now here's our show. First, if you want to hear the ATC audio from the crash, there's a YouTube video that has it. It's rather graphic as the pilot broadcast several expletives in the last few seconds before the crash, so you, you might not want to hear it. The plane crashed where the aircraft would be turning from the base to final turn, which is where stall spin accidents often occur, especially if an aircraft is overshooting that base to final turn. The crash site was about 1.4 nautical miles from the runway of 27 right. There are many interesting facets to this crash, but to me, the most salient fact is that the aircraft appears to have been very low as it crossed overhead the airport to join the downward leg for night landing to runway 27 right. Why the two pilots were that low is anybody's guess. Had they been even close to a normal traffic pattern altitude, everything might have worked out fine. Now let's dive into the details. The flight originated at KSNA, the John Wayne Airport. It was a short flight, just 18 minutes to KSEE, Gillespie Field, north of San Diego. The aircraft, November 880 Zulu, was a Learjet registered to Medjet LLC, which has a local El Cajon address, so the aircraft was probably based at Gillespie Field, which means the pilots were most likely very familiar with the airport. Now, MedJet's an air ambulance company, and there were four people on board, including the two pilots. Of course, everyone died. The airplane was on an instrument flight plan and climbed only to 11,000 feet before it started to fly the GPS-17 approach to runway 17. After checking in with the Gillespie Tower controller, the airplane was clear to land on runway 17. The pilot then canceled IFR and requested to land on runway 27 right. The controller then cleared him to land on runway 27 right. Now, weather was a really important factor as it has been rainy throughout most of California for the last three or four days. The weather at Gillespie Field was reported as winds variable at six knots, three mile visibility with mist. So the airport was just barely VFR. There was a broken layer of clouds at 2000 feet and an overcast layer even higher at 2600 feet. Now the mist may have also created an illusion. Here's what the FAA says in the Pilot Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge. Atmospheric haze can create an illusion of being at a greater distance and height from the runway. As a result, the pilot has a tendency to be low on the approach. Conversely, in extremely clear air, uh, those conditions can give the pilot the illusion of being closer than he or she actually is, resulting in a high approach that may result in an overshoot or go around. At one point, the accident pilot asked the tower to turn up the lights, and the tower responded that they were already at 100%. Now, that subtle clue may suggest that the reported mist was already affecting the crew's perception of distance and height. In my prior video, I wondered why the pilots didn't land straight into runway 17, since that would be the easiest thing to do after flying the GPS 17 approach. But what I overlooked was that runway 17 is just about 4,100 feet long, while runway 27 right is 1,000 feet longer at 5,340 feet. Many companies operating Learjets have op specs that dictate a minimum runway length, which is often 5,000 feet for this jet. Regardless, given that the runways were likely wet, it probably was a good decision to land on runway 27 right, though since the winds were light, runway 9 left could have also been a good option. It's significant that the pilots canceled IFR before requesting to land on runway 27 right. A review with the notes of the GPS 17 approach reveals a note that prohibits circling to runway 27 right at night. Thus, the pilots could not legally circle to runway 27 right while still on an IFR flight plan, which is why they had to first cancel IFR before requesting 27 right. But the FAA prevents circling at night for a reason, and it's likely the reason is the high terrain that's just two miles east of runway 27 right. Food for thought, if the FAA prohibits circling IFR to a runway at night, you should think long and hard about flying VFR to that runway at night, even though it's legal to do so. But the biggest problem was not the runway choice, but rather the altitude. The minimums for the GPS 17 approach are 
1,360 feet for aircraft with WAS capable GPSs and 20 feet higher for non WAS capable GPSs. But this aircraft reached 1,300 feet while it was still about three miles from runway 17, and it continued to descend. When it reached the threshold, it was at about 725 feet MSL, or just 340 feet above the runway. They crossed over the field at that altitude and then began a slow climb. By the time they turned onto the downwind, they were about 400 feet above the runway. And the last data point, as they were turning onto the base, was 950 feet MSL, or about 560 feet above the field elevation. Just for reference, at night, the traffic pattern altitude for left traffic to runway 27 right is 1,388 feet, or 1,000 feet AGL. So at their highest point in the traffic pattern, they were still about 450 feet below the traffic pattern altitude. And when you fly a traffic pattern altitude at about half the required height, there's a major perceptual problem that can cause you to fly a downwind that's too close to the runway. And that's in fact what happened to this aircraft. They flew a downwind that was just 0.8 nautical miles from the runway while flying at about 140 knots. Now, when I fly a Cirrus at 100 knots, I try to be at least 0.7 nautical miles from the runway on the downwind, and I prefer to be a little further out, perhaps a nautical mile from the runway. Why? Because at 100 knots, flying a downwind that's a mile from the runway, I'm confident that I have plenty of room to make the two turns to the runway without overshooting that base to final turn. Now, when we fly, our turn radius is proportional to the square of our speed. So if you're flying a little faster, you need a much bigger turn radius. For example, the turn radius when flying at 140 knots is almost double what it is for flying at 100 knots. So if I like being 0.7 to 1 mile from the runway on downward in a Cirrus, I know that at 140 knots, I want to be about double that, about somewhere between 1.4 to 2 miles from the runway on downwind. But this aircraft was about half that distance at 0.8 nautical miles, virtually guaranteeing that they would overshoot the base to final turn. And here's the perceptual problem that leads low-flying pilots to fly a downwind that's too close to the runway. Think about flying a normal traffic pattern at maybe 1,000 feet AGL. Think about what the airport looks like when you're on downwind, a beam from the runway. If you're in a high-wing aircraft, you might position yourself so that the runway crosses the strut in a particular place. Or if you're in a low wing, perhaps you'll position yourself so that the runway is just above the wingtip. Methods like this in common GA aircraft produce a downwind that's parallel to the runway and somewhere between 0.6 and 1.0 miles away from the runway. But now imagine you're just at 500 feet. To get that same view of the runway from the aircraft, you need to be half as close to the runway. So instead of perhaps being a mile from the runway on downwind, you're now just half a mile away. Now that cuts your base leg in half, and it creates a high probability of overshooting the base to final turn. So when circling at an MDA that's below pattern altitude, force yourself to fly a downwind that looks farther than normal from the runway. You might also use a moving map or GPS to provide another measure of how far your downwind is from the runway. Planning ahead like this can help prevent you from overshooting the base to final turn. So why were the pilots so low to begin with? It's hard to think of a good reason for being that low, unless the pilots were planning to land on runway 17 and change their minds fairly late. But that seems unlikely as past flight aware tracks show this aircraft always landing on 27 right or 9 left. And their op specs may not have even allowed them to land on 17. Of course, it's possible they were low to stay below low scattered clouds, though none were reported below 2,000 feet. However, just 45 minutes after the crash, Gillespie Field did begin reporting a scattered layer of clouds at 1,100 feet. It's also possible the pilots just got lower than they planned to in error. One of the most common factors in accidents is distraction. Then it's possible that one or both pilots got distracted by something and ended up descending lower than they had planned to. It's also possible, though I think highly unlikely, that the pilots entered the wrong barometric pressure into their altimeter and that they were therefore flying hundreds of feet lower than the altitude indicated on their instruments. Well, any pilot could make that mistake. It seems unlikely that two professional pilots would make that mistake and not notice it. We'll probably never know for sure why they were so low, but being low was clearly an important link in the accident chain. If you're wondering why the pilots didn't instead fly an approach to runway 27 right, the answer is there are no approaches to runway 27 right. 
There is an approach to runway nine left, but it's limited to slower aircraft flying in category A or B. The Learjet 35 would typically be flown in either category C or D, so they couldn't fly that approach. In summary, it appears that these pilots had a stall spin accident on the base to final turn. This accident is very reminiscent of the Challenger 604 crash in Trekkie earlier this year, in which that pilot crashed at the base to final turn after circling the land invisibility that was reduced by forest fire smoke. Personally, one of my personal minimums is that I will not circle at night, especially if there's any weather. However, these pilots had few good options for getting into Gillespie Airport at night. If you ever find yourself overshooting the base to final turn, I'd suggest that you go around if you're VFR or fly the published missed approach if you're IFR. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to the Aviation News Talk podcast.